Welcome again to Following Historic Trails, and again we have our uh, Lethbridge Institution with us. <coughs> we, we were talking last day about the theaters, and we, uh, we haven't finished it, and uh, we've had requests if we would continue on with the theaters before we go on to Shack's many other activities. Before I do, I want to again mention uh, we'll be giving away one of these 100th anniversary plan books to someone that can answer the skill testing question that we're going to give later on in the program. Now, I would like to point out, I don't know if you can see it, it really doesn't matter, but in the book you'll find a picture of the Starland, right. um, and I believe this is back in uh, uh, 1920 or so, That's right. and uh, you, you'll get a lot of what we've been talking about just from picking up this book. And if you don't win it, uh, by the way, it is available at uh, many of the newsstands, including Woodward's. But let's get back to theaters. Now, we were talking about the, you want to have a look? <laughs> yes, I want to see that. That brings yeah. back a lot of memories. I bet it does. There's no doubt about that. The, we're, we uh, want to go back to, I think we'll start at the Paramount again. We were talking just briefly about uh, two things that I remember. Uh, was it the robe that came in? Oh, brought yeah, in the robe came in the Cinemascope. Yeah, uh, was, that was uh, the first one, one of the first, oh, uh, magnificent width. And what did it do? Did it just expand the size of the picture or what, uh, Cinemascope? Well, we have, a, of course, uh, we have a great big screen that is covered by what they call masking. Mm -hmm. and that this black masking comes in or out, electrically controlled, you understand, because all movies come in one, on a standard size, 35 millimeter, mm -hmm. and that's the standard. We call that flat, mm -hmm. and then it goes from there, it goes to CinemaScope, and uh, quite a few pictures today are coming in in CinemaScope, and the projectionist up, uh, in the projection room just presses a button. He can go from flat, that is the standard, we call it flat, so standard movies, and then he presses a button and goes to CinemaScope. You, if, if you're alert when you go to the theater, you, if it's being done, if, if a short subject should be on in flat in the main picture and CinemaScope, you'll see the curtain. You, mm. it's, oh, it's, it, you don't object to it, it's just gradually, it, 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 it's an asset. And it's a tremendous picture. It becomes that much wider. Did this come because the threat of television and, and this type no, of thing? No, it just came because producers wanted something different. They're always reaching for the moon. Right. Now, the Cinerama. Cinerama was well, found in that certain was, cities. That was it? kind of a fad, but it's coming back a little bit more now where they're taking and they're bending the curve. They're going to great uh, 50 millimeters. They're, they're trying everything. I noticed they got one theater in Calgary and and one in Edmonton doing it, but they, th they put movies in those theaters that run maybe for six months or a year. You can't afford to make that installation and run movies and play them one week, two weeks, or three weeks. So they have Cinerama in places like Calgary, do they? Yes. Oh, I see. Now, the other uh, thing I remember is uh, the great 3D and the glasses. Tell oh, us yes. a bit about that. Well, that's another fad. Oh, I see. But that has been uh, hit and miss. You have these glasses and... <laughs> You, you, the public, don't realize the, the junk. Uh, when I say junk, we have to add on to our equipment to, so it projects through on the screen so that you get scared with that. Now, you had such films like The House of Wax. Yeah, well, we have film. to bring this different equipment, and it, it, it has to be attached to the projectors that we've got. Okay, these came in, as I, I think, uh, the first time. Maybe they came in earlier than me, but uh, I recall, uh, I think it was the late 50s or so. Yes, they well, they keep trying them, but they haven't perfected them where they've been a, su a real success. They're a fad. Unless they can improve on them, they'll still be a fad. And I imagine in the future they'll come up every now and again mm -hmm. to encourage the people to come and see something different in the theater. Now, these were red and blue glasses, I, I know. think. Now, the last time they came in, they came in with a different type of glasses. Is that right? Uh, sort of like Polaroid glasses. Yes, uh, Polaroid. They were Polaroid. Well, they were all the same color. That's uh, right. Yeah. Well, they had a new idea. But, but it didn't work any better, eh? It, it didn't work any better, <laughs> no. But we had to buy the glasses and give them a, That's why I say all this stuff, all this paraphernalia just to get it. I see. I missed. I really didn't pay much attention to the last. But it may time come in the future. They're mm -hmm. right now. They're working on. They're working on new sound equipment all the time. Here we are being televised now. But he, uh, he must know. The man that's looking at us, uh, running the running the cameras. He knows the new equipment. It never ends. It never that's ends. Right, yeah. The camera of t today 
is obsolete tomorrow. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so you've got the, the Paramount, and it was the Paramount for a long time. Then you built the second theater. Paramount number two, yes. Uh, how many years later was that, that you came up with the second one? Uh, well, the Paramount number one was open. Well, I always try to open them on Thanksgiving Day. Why? Well, it was just... Tradition, eh? A tradition. <laughs> uh, uh, I figure it was a lucky street, lucky omen. Oh, I see. Okay. And we opened that, and, and um, uh, former Judge Turcott, he, he dedicated it with me on the stage of the Paramount Theater. Must have been about five years later when we built the, uh, we built the uh, Paramount number two. Because mm -hmm. prior to that, we'd gone out into the highway on Mary McGrath, and we were in the, into the college. And we haven't talked about the drive-in industry either. That, well, that uh, came we the drive-in came into our in, into our fold in 1951. Uh, the original uh, uh, company that built that that was uh, Western Western Drive-in Theaters out of Calgary. They built a drive-in here, and they built a drive-in in Calgary, and they built one in Edmonton. And uh, all of a sudden. One day I got a phone call from Calgary saying that famous players were meeting with the, with the, the officials, the Western Drive-In people, saying that was Reg, Reg, uh, Reg Dutton, the hockey player, and Frank Kershaw, and a group like that. And uh, they were going to make a deal for, to buy, that is, famous players would make a deal with the Western Drive-In Theatre Company to buy Cal Calgary, Edmonton, and Lethbridge. So I went to Calgary and closed the deal quick. Mm -hmm. uh, when I say quick, I, had, I didn't want to spend three or four days. Either we bought it or we didn't buy it. So we bought it and uh, took it over in 1951. But lo and behold, I found out the other part of the deal did not go through. They didn't buy it. They didn't buy Calgon Edmonds. <laughs> so, but subsequently, a couple of years later, they did make percentage deals or something like that. But I was not involved, nor was any company that I was interested in involved with what went on in Calgary. Was it a good deal? Did the, the, the Well, it was at first, because we had Mom, Pa, Kettle, and John Wayne, and that, and, and the big secret was bring the babies, and everything was family shows. And we were proud to operate it. We had a playground, and, mm -hmm. and it was a great thing. Oh, that was a real, a real thrill. And then times changed. Of course, TV came in, and they didn't have to come bring the kiddies there. They leave them at home and lying on the floor looking at TV. Now today, with the change of mode in pictures, not only do we have family pictures, we have mature pictures, we have restricted pictures in general. So we have to advertise what we're playing. So that kind of eliminated the children in many cases. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that continues to exist today because they're more daring in the scenes that you're seeing in the movies today prompted the provincial government to adopt the censorship rating. Mm -hmm. And that's what's in effect today. Now, I'm a, I can always remember hearing Grand and Glory's plans for other things on that drive-in lot. Um, was there not going to be a cloverleaf, for example, um, at that spot? Yes, it, it, we, that kind of muted our expansion, if I may use that expression. And we do have another location right down on the jail road. We have plans for a triple drive-in there. But in the meantime, having made that purchase, made the decision to close the existing one, that is the Green Acres, we had to turn around and change our mind completely and continue with the, with the Green Acres drive-in because business went from a high peak to a low level. And we, we've, low level is existing now, and we're trying to bring it back at uh, Green Acres before we move for any expansion. And, and I would say, the, looking down the road, the drive-in theaters will, there won't be the expansion. It will be gradually fade away. Right. I'll tell you why. It's a five or six month business operation. And no one's going to put in as we would have to on the jail road, a million dollars or more. And a million dollars is a lot of money. And if, if we could take a million dollars today, if we had it in cash, and we, we could invest it on, on interest rates, say, uh, an average of 10%, we'd make a eh? $100,000 mm -hmm. for doing nothing. So why should we put a million dollars in and gamble whether we're going to make fifteen, twenty, dollars or $30,000? So we've abandoned any expansion idea for the jail road for the time being, unless in the future when I won't be here, my son 
mm -hmm. and the company decides that. Mm -hmm. That is, if Bob sees merit in the expansion or the continuance of drive-in theaters, then that expansion will take place, and we will sell the Green Acres. The Green Acres, I think, is a very valuable corner. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure you've heard the argument many times over the years that uh, the theater business is doomed. Uh, period. That, is uh, which? Doomed. That uh, videotapes are going to throw theaters completely out of business. Uh, we we uh, have weathered the incoming or the inroads of radio. We've weathered the incoming of TV, of color TV. And it's our opinion that we can weather the inroads of tapes and what have you. People will always want to go out to be entertained as they are do. They go to the rock show, they can see rock on TV, but they don't. They go out to the sportplex by the tens of thousands. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Sam, the, what do you think the next step is for theaters? For theaters? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know as I can answer. I'm not qualified to answer that question because technicians are working on these inventions for years. The only thing I can see is we will have to continue to be the first to make the best pictures that the public are buying. Uh, they go in cycles. Back to the Future, the picture at the Paramount now is one of the, as an example, it's one of the finest pictures we've played for a long time. Yet the other pictures, are, they're great on, on uh, horror shows. And what, what's going to be the cycle in the future? I can't tell. How about family shows? Uh, well, family shows have disappeared. That's unfortunate. And uh, we want more of them. Uh, do you think there's a trend for them to be coming back at all, or are they gone? Well, uh, it's unfortunate, and I'm going to say this with my tongue in my cheek. The people have not, in the last two or three years, supported family shows like they should. And that's very disappointing to the, not only to us, but to the producers. Mm -hmm. We'd like more family shows. Disney, Disney was the backbone of the family shows. Is he still around? Are they still making? Well, of course, both the Disney, uh, they're passed away. Yeah, but the companies, are they? The still company's still in, in, in business. But what Disney says, if a production's going to cost from 10 to 20 million, which was unheard of years ago, we can't make that kind of a family show just for families where the admission is $2, where the admission for an adult will say, uh, in the United States, is, is averaging $5. Mm -hmm. And income at five dollars is considerably different, mm -hmm. a lot different than two dollars or two fifty for kids. Right. And they they play theaters on percentage. We don't buy pictures; they're on percentage. They take the major portion of our money. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, cable vision. Here we are. You were tied in with cable vision there for a while too, weren't you? Well, no, no. Was I tied in? I started it in Lethbridge. All right. Tell us about how this evolved. And uh, it seems kind of strange that a theater man would be involved in cable vision. Well, it was a funny thing. I, again, on one trip to Toronto, Mr. Fitzgibbons was president of, uh, of uh, Famous Players. He says, Shaq, he says, why don't you look in Lethbridge to see if you can get out in the country and get a signal? I said, what are you talking about? He told me about the signal coming and picking up these shows. So we, we made a test uh, in a, uh, they had the instrument to go and make a test. And they made, made a test and found that there was an area we could pick, pick up a signal. We were getting it down from the border, across the border from translators, which was already established down there. Mm -hmm. And he said, we'll form a company. We'll apply to the government for a license. We'll apply for the city of Lethbridge to get the wires on the telephone poles. And because I, being established in Lethbridge, I did most of the groundwork for that. And we formed the company called Cable Vision uh, uh, Lethbridge Limited. And there was four companies, Famous Players, the TV station, uh, uh, Esteban Company, and Lethbridge Theatres. There was four mm -hmm. of us started. And of course, we had all the headaches. Oh, boy. Tell us about some. Oh, <laughs> that was a tough grind. No, that was, that was a really a bitter experience for us. It was a bitter, but a very interesting one. You learn lessons of how you go. Mm -hmm. Now you look back, although we sold our interest in it because they're now microwave, microwave, can, we could have had microwave from the beginning, we'd have had, our, we'd have had it made. I would never would have sold it. <laughs> it's one of the mistakes you make. You, uh, because it was hard work, to, hard work to produce from the United States and pick up on a mountaintop. And I used to go up and climb up this 
uh, wasn't a big mountain, we climbed it, yeah, you couldn't, you get up with a windlass and get a truck to go up there. We had translators to pick up the signal up in the air, and we transmitted it to Lethbridge over. Now, you must be talking about the, the mid-60s now, are you? Well, I guess that'd be the years, be the Well, 60s. you must have been in pretty good shape if you're climbing up all these mountains and... Well, <laughs> well, I use the word mountain because we got up in the car and we have to climb the rest of the part. Oh, yes, it went up pretty steep, all right. Then they had a windlass on the on the truck we took up there, and they wind get it on the tree, and they wind the truck up. We had to take equipment up there. <laughs> now there's one little theater that we we left out here. I, as I recall, there was a little theater over in the north side. The Lealta. And that was your that yeah, was your big competition in town, I guess. Well, he's named Mr. Dowsley. And yes, he was he was our opposition, but he was a fine gentleman. We mm -hmm. didn't mind it. It was fine. Did we didn't we we had no fence built around Lethbridge. Did you uh, ever think of buying them out? No, it was too small. You see, I tell you why. You know what it was at first? It was a bank. Oh yeah. It's only a little bit of a little bit of a theater, and you couldn't get cinemascope in there. You couldn't get a screen big enough in there. Mm -hmm. and that's why he closed down. He couldn't get. He could only run little films. He couldn't run cinemascope in there. Yeah. And with the sound equipment, it was too small to to make money in. Hmm. As I recall, he used to uh, sell a lot of china. Yes, the, he, he promoted his business by giving away China, yes. Well, were you in the China business too? You must have been. Oh, well, we, gave, we gave away fancy stuff for dress, dress wear. We had dress wear nights, yes. Oh, we tried everything. I bet you run into people now that say, hey, I got one of your dishes in my cupboard, etc., etc. Well, we <laughs> didn't have dishes. We copied. Calgary started that. Uh, J.B. Barron started that in the Grand Theater. He started this uh, dish business and made him. <coughs> so we decided we, if he could do it, we'd do it here in Lethbury. We did it with dresser wear. Hmm. And of course, what they do, they'd send somebody down to buy, to buy a ticket, and they get a piece of dresser wear, and they, they ask if they could use the phone, and they'd phone and say, Mother, don't bother, it's only a comb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, we want to get into some of your other activities because there's so many other things you were involved in. Uh, let's start with the mayor. Or city council. When did you first get on to city council? Uh, 19, 1964. 1964. That's when you were... 1944. Yeah, I was saying. 1944, sure big part. Before that. Um, all right. Then you were alderman for how many years before you became mayor? Well, I was alderman for two or three years. You understand we had managerial form of government where the, where the council appointed the mayor, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I served as two years, first two years as mayor. Actually, I took over one year. I forget, somebody passed away on the council, left one year open, and I said I would offer my service and run, and I ran. I think I got in by acclamation that year. And having once got in, then the, the, my turn come up, I'd have to run again. I took a two-year term, and during that time, the C Civic Government Association, such as it was then, that really controlled the council, the word control is a misconception. They didn't control it, but they, they controlled it this way. They went around and, and selected people to run for the council. And then we had a, a, an open convention, and you nominated those who you wanted to, wanted to serve on the council. Mm -hmm. So when it came to who would run for mayor, you just put your hand up like that. Did you aspire for the office? And, and I had been approached before I put my hand up. I wasn't going to put my hand up and be a dummy up there. I knew that, that C.J. had enough candidates in there of the seven. I knew they had a majority of four, that if I put my hand up, I would be elected mayor. Hmm. And that was the way it was done. And then I didn't, uh, I, I never canvassed anybody thereafter. Nice. When, the, when the position of mayor came up every year. You didn't get a year, two-year term. You got every year. Now, just going back to the CJ, CGA, uh, this type of a set up government system. Do you think this was a democratic, as the open type of system, or not? I think it was. Uh, I think it was an excellent one because now everybody's independent, and they, and they you can tell they look around the table. And, they, and I'm not being unfair. They, you can see who votes and who, who goes with who, and you you still you still now see they've gone they expanded the council to nine. Well, they've got to have a majority of five, eh? Five to four, and mm -hmm. the mayor has the deciding vote sometimes. Mm -hmm. All right. Now you were you were um... you you get that clear on CGA? They they faded out the business. They faded out the picture completely. 
and they used to collect the money and get get the candidates, and we'd have political meetings in in the central uh, junior high up there, and you voted yeah. for who you wanted. Why did the CGA fade away? Well, because <clears throat> we found this out at this political meeting there that somebody wasn't nominated, they was run as independent. We found independents were starting to get a toehold in the council. And there's no reason why they shouldn't. I well remember Mr. Virtue. He was one of the best uh, councilors we had. Cliff Black and so on through the list. Mm -hmm. So I advised them uh, when they started this independent business, I said, you don't need CJA, you better all go on your own steam. Mm -hmm. And then they started to call themselves independent CGA. Well, you can't have independent CGA. You are, you're either a party on, look, you're either a party on council or you're not. Let's call a spade a spade right. if you want. And I think they should have continued with the CGA so that you would know that there was a group representing you. And of course, they all represent you, uh, and they still all represent you today, but you don't know which one will vote for this or that for you. Yeah. They're so independent that the, they could have a split vote and the mayor has to make the deciding, cast the deciding vote. Now you were alderman um, when they cleaned up the city um, of the red light district. For oh example. yes. Are you uh, prepared to tell us a little bit about that? Well that uh, that was a very simple simple maneuver, exercise we'll call it that. We got word from Edmund from the uh, health department that that they, they had to be closed. We called it the line or the red light district. Those places were there and they, they came to the theater. I, I knew most of the girls to see when they came in the theater and the men that lived there with them. They were, they, they were well behaved. They never bothered anybody. They came to the theater and they shopped in the city. I read one article where they said they never came shopping. They certainly did. You can tell them by the dress they had. They had the best furs. They, they best bought the best uh, tickets for the theater. But anyway, we got a message that we must close it. And the reason being VD, of course. They said that if that continued, when men went there, that they would, if they contacted any disease, they would transmit it to others and it had to be eradicated. And the only way to do it was to eliminate this particular area, which we call the red light district down there. So prior to that time, the, the police department knew it was there. Everybody knew it was there. They were back there on 3rd Street and 4th Street. So the, we, in that time, uh, during my term as mayor, we had decided we, we got to renovate our police department. In other words, revitalize it and make it one of the best. How would we do that? So we went to the Mounted Police and we got Staff Sergeant Harvey to come to head the police and be the chief. And boy, when he took over, now, when he went to... When he did anything, he did it. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. If I had a deserved a parking ticket, I got it. And that, that was the condition we hired him. And we got him out of the mounted police to work for the city as the chief of police. And he told the men who were then in the police force, says, go down and tell them down there, the place is closed. They didn't believe it at first. So he, he went down the second time said, out. And they just quietly disappeared. I see. Um, okay, what are some of the other uh, highlights that you remember of your early days on council? Well, Anything that stands out? Well, there's many, th everything stands out. It stands out uh, my association with Mr. Jack Watson, the city manager, one of the finest managers we ever had here. He put, really, put the city on his feet. You see, you have to go back to 19, the years that I spent here in 1930 and 33, the Depression days come in there. And there was, a, with the war coming in there, there was time that we could, uh, we, you wouldn't uh, have to pay any taxes at all. We just kept accumulating, we owned our own power plant. Mm -hmm. That's a controversial issue in the mm -hmm. city, the power issue. Right. We were making so much money, we accumulated enough money with, that we didn't need a, we had a reserve fund that we didn't need to tax the taxpayers for any taxes. But we, we kept the money there. It was, a good, it was a good cushion for when we wanted to expand the city. And expanding the city jumped with leaps, leaps and bounds when the war ended. Mm -hmm. the, um, you, I'm not sure if you mentioned, what year did you become mayor? Beg your pardon? What year did you become mayor? Mm, well, I had so many... 
I'd have to guess these dates. You see, I, I maybe was mayor for two years or three years, and then I didn't aspire because I could see in council there was a, a move. They wanted somebody else, like there was Jardine, there was, there was Turcotte, there was Schering, and Russell Haig. By mm -hmm. the way, Russell Haig. Mm -hmm. But I, was, I fitted in all the t uh, various periods. Uh, a total of uh, 10 years, but never continuous oh, 12 see. years. You see, mm -hmm. I maybe served two, and then I didn't run, and then something would happen. I'd take on, uh, you say, who aspired, I'd get the confidence of the council, I'd be for the next two or one, whatever the case may be. Did this cause uh, particular problems, the fact that you were having these breaks in the middle, or would it have been easier just to keep on going? Like No, I, matter, <coughs> matter of fact, it was, it was entirely optional on my part, but I, I wanted to avoid friction in the council. Why should I oppose, say, Mr. Virtue? He never, never was mayor. I, I, I would know in advance that he had enough votes that he was going to be mayor. So I said I didn't aspire, and, I, and I'd sit on the side of the alderman. Mm -hmm. the, um, we're running out of time, Shaq, and that we've got to ask our question. So could I just see this book here for a second? And uh, I know what we'll do. Um, I'll ask the people if they remember what the picture was, which theater it was that uh, Shaq was connected with. We looked at the picture at the very beginning of the uh, program and don't give us the answer because they're going to contact the, the station, I hope, in the next week. We hope and, so. And um, be the first person to, to remember uh, what the picture was. I should say there's a lot of people standing on Main Street. They, they seemed oh, to yeah. stand in the middle of yeah. the street, didn't they, and uh, just chat away. I, you I weren't afraid of getting run over then. <laughs> I guess not. No. Well, this has been a very pleasant two-week shack, and there's so many things we haven't touched upon. I think we're going to have to have you back at a, a later date because I know that we can go on for another two pro programs very easily because there's so much... But anyway, thanks for coming, and I hope our listeners enjoyed yeah, it's it. Been a, it's been a pleasure, but there's been so much you haven't covered. Not, not that I want to be before the cameras all the time, but it's yeah. been an exciting 65 years well, I for know me. That, 65. I, we were looking at, uh, what, reams and reams of clippings just earlier today, and uh, I know there's a lot of things we have to come back I mean, and talk about. 65 years is a long time. Oh, yeah, but you're still looking young. Eh? <laughs> sure you are. Okay, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Thank you. That's a good book. Yeah, take that. There's some something in there. I never thought you would question me on dates.